my name is John Berry. Um, it's indeed a pleasure to welcome you this morning to our webinar on leadership and crisis. Um, just a quick introduction. Um, my name's John. I'm the chairman of Cognition Marketing. Uh, we're an agency based in um, Birmingham and also we have offices in London and in Parma. And uh, today we've got a series of webinars. This is our second one in the series, which is about leadership in crisis. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get going. Um, one is you'll find at the bottom of the, um, the tab on the webinar, there's a Q&A button. If you'd like to ask questions, we'd love you to um, go into that Q&A and put questions into, the, um, into that pop-up box. Um, if you'd like to, if you see a questionnaire that you'd really like to push up the queue, you can upvote it. And um, if you'd like to raise a hand, we'd ask you to do that during the Q&A session and we can ask a question directly at that time. So um, that's just a few housekeeping. If, if you're having at all any problems with getting on or hearing the webinar, just go into the Q&A straight away and ask us. We've got an administrator in the background who will help you and get you set up. Um, today's webinar is being brought to you by Cognition Agency. That's our web address. And also we're delighted to have um, Alan Chambers who's um, joined us from the Extreme Leaders um, and this is their website too. So this morning's webinar is um, I'm delighted to introduce to you our sort of two guest speakers. Um, the first one is Dr. Peter Hughes. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Hughes is a, a doctor of psychology. Um, his work's taking him to many varied places, um, working with business people in times of crisis. Um, he's worked with addicts on film sets. We're literally trying to get actors and actresses are ready to be able to take on um, their latest assignment. He's worked with homeless people and real people that are on the, the margins of society and dealing with their points of crisis. Um, Peter's also um, one of the founders of Cognition alongside our managing director, Tim Witchley. And so we welcome Peter to this morning's webinar and he'll be joining us as a panelist at the, um, after the talk this morning. Um, I'm shortly introduced to you, Alan Chambers, as well. Um, before I do, just a quick introduction about the webinar. Um, in 9-11, um, there were two American leaders that uh, had the opportunity to redeem themselves by demonstrating leadership qualities. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, the mayor of New York, and the president himself, George W. Bush, had chronic um, poll ratings with the general public and so they both went into that particular crisis in a in a very difficult position but both emerged from the 9-11 crisis um, having established their leadership credentials why was that um, there's been many interesting case studies written on that particular piece of leadership and um, just to summarize some of those thoughts, it's, it, they really got to grips with it early. They recognized the issue early. They did some important sense making, trying to get collective understanding. Um, they built consensus quickly. Um, they were courageous and took critical decisions when they needed to take them. They coordinated the response and delegated well. They were visible through the crisis. They communicated passionately. Um, they showed empathy and connected with the American public. And I think more than anything, it, which is what fundamentally leadership is about, is they led by example. So there's some good textbook thoughts from a particular case study um, of leadership in crisis. But today isn't about textbooks. We can all read textbooks. It's much more exciting to hear about leadership in practice and get a sense of um, what it really is like to deal with um, what the world can throw at you, what the environment can throw at you, and dealing with those challenges on a moment by moment basis. And with that in mind, I'm delighted to introduce you this morning to Alan Chambers. Um, Alan was the first British person to um, 
undertake a unsupported expedition to Canada um, across the, um, the, the, um, the Northern Territories to the North Pole. He actually trekked 672 nautical miles at temperatures less than 65 degrees centigrade. Um, he's got 16 years service with the Royal Marines. He was awarded an MBE by Her Majesty the Queen in 2000 for, I just read it here, determination and leadership in constant adversity. Um, as a rugby and cricket fan, um, I was excited to understand that Alan was invited by Sir Clive Woodward into the, um, into the preparations for the 2003 World Cup to talk to the team there, uh, the England rugby team. And he also was invited in by Duncan Fletcher to go and speak to the Ashes winning team uh, that beat Australia in 2005. So it's real pleasure to invite Alan to, uh, to join us this morning, who's going to be talking to us about uh, the practicalities of leadership in crisis. Alan. Thanks very much, John. Um, let me share this screen. There we go. Are we good? Thanks very much, John. I just like to really start from, from where, where you finished, really. I've spent my whole career working in teams, whether it be in the military, in the Royal Marines, and, and very fortunate to transition over into the adventure world. So basically, today, I'd, I'd like to tell you a, a story. Um, you know, I do like the storytelling side of life to put these leadership or to get these leadership messages across. And I think from the many expeditions I've been involved in, and especially the ones over the last 15 years that I've, I've actually put together and led, I think the best, the best journey is, is the one you've described. So that, that for me was a really big learning curve for me, for not just the leadership side of it, self-leadership, but also about the management of teams under immense stress. So I'd like to use a, uh, one big journey, one story, and that was about how I put together a project, designed, planned, and trained the team um, to work unsupported from Canada to the North Pole. And the picture you can see in front of you, hopefully, um, doesn't do it justice. This is the top of the world. This is 90 degrees north. This is the geographic North Pole, the northern axis of planet Earth. So we can talk all day about visions and goals, but actually there's nothing there. It's just a piece of frozen ice. It's just frozen water. It's just a great big frozen ocean. So it's how do you keep that vision alive with your team under immense stress? So my background really is, is, has been from a military point of view, um, being involved in teams and then creating my own teams to deliver massive challenges where I'd say the outcome is uncertain. A little bit like today in, in some ways, you know, people are anxious about what's coming or what's not coming or what the future looks like. On most of our expeditions, they've never been done before. So we haven't really got a template to, uh, to, to follow. But also you have to put one foot in front of the other. It's not a given that you're going to get to the top or to the bottom of the world. So I'd like to take you on a journey really um, to the top of the planet. So I want to work back from what you can see now, which is the North Pole and just give you a little bit of background. So North Pole, geographic North Pole, 90 degrees north in the center of a frozen ocean. So our, our still air temperature for the first month was minus 55 degrees Celsius. The coldest we got down to with wind chill on this, on this project was minus 72 degrees Celsius. Obviously that's quite a cheeky temperature to work in, Never mind motivate your team and get them doing the same thing day in, day out, every day for 70 days. We wanted to work, to, to walk unsupported, so You'll understand the context of this later on, especially when we talk about mindset and resource. But unsupported means no outside help. Once you go live, it's just down to you to deliver. So you'll, you'll see in, in about 15 minutes how we had to keep reinventing ourselves, readapting the plan because we had no resupply. There was no plane coming. There was no parachute drop, no resupplies, no Husky teams. It was virtually down to us as a team to actually deliver the project, come what may. And that is what I really love about the world I work in. The outcome is uncertain. You do have to work at it if you want a result. So geographic North Pole, top of the planet in the center of an ocean. We wanted to go from Canada as well. And this makes it a little bit more difficult because the Arctic Ocean, when it's frozen, it moves. And it moves from Siberia, historically, across the ocean towards Canada. So you can take the easy option and start on the Siberian coastline and go with the drift. That's been done before. So we didn't want to be the third, fourth, fifth team in the world to make it from Siberia. We want to be the first British team to make it from Canada. So our reality was we were walking against the tide, 
constantly, all day, every day. We would walk forward five miles, it would take us 10 hours to walk five miles. While we're asleep, we'll get pushed back six. So we'd always wake up a mile behind where we finished the day before. You know, see how important the mental resilience was, but how I prepared the team to, to be aware of that. So it wasn't a shock that we were going to lose ground or ice as we went forward. So that was the goal. First British, first British team unsupported, the wrong way, in the dark, to the top of the world. Sounds really simple. It's one line on a piece of A4, and that was the dream. I spent five years planning the trip, five years training on top of a demanding day job, five years investing in myself. I went around Europe and I interviewed every team that had, that had uh, attempted this and um, that had failed. I read all their books, their reports, their post-expedition reports. I used the internet, the Royal Geographic Society, the Scottish Geographic Society. Five years of data. On top of that, I went and made a personal commitment to go and live with a family of Inuits. So in the Northwest Territories of Canada, every year for five years, for a month or two months, I went and lived with the same family of Inuits. Not so much to understand their culture, but to learn from generations upon great leaders and great families that have lived out on the ice. So this is more about trying to reduce the risk on the team and hopefully increase the success of the project by understanding cloud formations, ice formations, weather risks, the polar bear, the hunt, how a polar bear hunts, all these kind of things that have been, lessons have been handed down that hadn't been lost within the Inuit community. So five years investment uh, living with the Inuits. And I used the opportunity to test and trial all the clothing, the equipment and safety procedures that was out on the market at the time. And this was really interesting for me because um, I'm a big believer in the old way is not the only way to do things. So the old way, everybody had failed and I, I was trying to work out why no British team could make it. What was the big black hole up there that nobody could get beyond? And for me, it was just a, a lack of research really. And it was, so I spent five years trying to, obviously trying to increase our chance of success, but it came really obvious that people were trying to pull too heavy a sledge. And I know it sounds really simple, but for me, everything weighs something. So I came up with, a, with basically a really simple mantra for the team, which was reduce the weight, increase the pace and deliver the project. So all of a sudden now I'm trying to work out what I need, what I'd love to take and what we desperately need for safety. And it was just the bare essentials we took on the trip. So we had no frills whatsoever. On the, on the expedition, we, we allowed ourselves half a pencil, one photograph and one diary. No, no audio books, no, no music, no headphones, no reading books, no playing cards, no chess sets, no Scrabble. They will not help you get to the North Pole. So it was just the bare essentials. So being quite disciplined in what we really needed to deliver the project and the challenge, we started to reduce our weight. Five years was, was invaluable to go and live with the Inuits to understand how, how I could hopefully reduce the risk. So it was a huge project for me, for making the decision to not just lead the project, but plan it and spend five years training. Over those five years, obviously I had to select a team. So I, um, I had a call to action across the UK and asked, asked for volunteers to join this project. Um, first British team to the North Pole from Canada, unassisted. I expected 5,000 volunteers, I only got seven. I needed six people in the team. So my kind of team selection team training, three months program went out the window to 24 hours. So I asked everybody to come down to the office for a 24 hour interview. And from that 24 hour interview, I would choose the six I was gonna put in my squad before I actually finally choose four. So I had quite limited resources on personnel. So I was really looking for character more than skill set. In fact, I was definitely looking for attitude and character and their behavior more than skill set. I can teach people skills. I can teach them how to ski, pull up a tent in a blizzard, build an igloo in three hours. What I was really looking for was people's deep down passion and behavior to go above and beyond. So we finally get our team of six and then we move over to Canada into the base camp. So this is back with the family of Inuits that have adopted me for five years. And then we do our final preparations and we've reduced the weight quite a bit, quite considerably by questioning history in the last 25 years of polar travel. We designed a brand new sledge. So our sledge, the old sledges weighed 50 pounds, ours only weighed nine. So we kind of embraced all the innovation, innovation that was available to us at the time. And we thought that was it. We'd probably reduce the weight, maybe by 40, 50 pounds, you know, on the sledge, but overall, possibly 70 pounds. And just before we went live, it dawned on me that I've only questioned the last 25 years of polar history. I've only gone back 25 years, so modern polar history, to question what equipment and clothing and plan and strategy they had. And all of a sudden, the penny dropped. I've got, a, I've got an opportunity before we go live now to make a huge step change and try to reduce the weight safely to give ourselves the best possible chance. So I question 150 years of history. I question the greats in my world. 
And the greats really are Captain Scott, Shackleton, Mawson, Amundsen, Nansen, the true great explorers that paved the way for the rest of us just to have a little play up in the Arctic and Antarctica, going back 150 years. And I questioned the diet. So I changed the whole polar diet from a high fat diet to a high, high, high carbohydrate diet. The critics wrote me off and said, it'll never work. No one's ever done this before. But the penny dropped. All the data has been in front of me for five years. And it wasn't until 4J Towns before we go live, I realized that we can make a big change. So the old explorers, they had a 56% fat diet because they went away for 150, 170 days at a time. This was only 60. This is a bed and breakfast compared to the old explorers. So actually we've got an opportunity to break the mold, start something completely new, and we took a high carbohydrate diet. The thinking was all we need is fuel into our body. As long as we keep the top two inches together, we've got the best chance anybody's ever got of getting to the North Pole from Canada. So by having the courage to pioneer something completely new in my world, our sledges went from 400 pounds to 256. So it's having that courage and bravery to question history and then start something completely new. And it's interesting that our diet has become the modern short-term polar diet up to about 45 days on the ice and that that really big decision helped us obviously to, to, to succeed by reducing the weight of our sledges so we've still got an opportunity even though it's only two days before we go live to believe in our research believe in our planning and increase our chances to succeed the second largest thing that i i, I noticed doing my research was that typically 99 percent of, of all the polar books I ever read, no matter where, what country, uh, what, what the leader was or where the team came from, they had a very simple way of managing their projects or managing their people. And that was, I'm the leader, I put the project together, I got the sponsorship, follow me. And eventually, that disengages the team from the leader. And then what I read through, as you read through people's diaries and books from past expeditions, they become a real complete detach in, between, in what the team want and what the leader wants because that person is at the front all day, every day, making every decision, which way they go, how they get over obstacles, how long they walk, how fast they walk. And the rest of the team have no input in the day-to-day -day, uh, of the challenge of that mile or 10 miles or 15 miles. And I realized that this, this, way of, or this, this style of leadership on the ice used to split teams and the dynamic would break down very quickly, especially if you read... And it's quite interesting reading, you know, the same, same team's books, but from different people on different days and what their thoughts are and their perception of how the trip is going. So I came up with, a, with an idea of leading from the back. So for me, leading from the back is, uh, is it's quite interesting because I, I, I thought we believed we became more efficient if I led from the back. I can easily be at the front with a GPS and a compass and, and, and follow me the old style. But actually, I needed the team to engage every single day, every hour of every day. So I put myself at the front for an hour and then I would spend the rest of the day at the back of the group. Advantages for me are huge and for the team, to be honest, and the rest of the team. But for me, mainly, I could see my team all day leading from the back. I could see who was getting stronger, who was getting weaker, who had an injury, who was hiding an injury. And I can change the team around depending on what I can see. You never see all these tiny little differences if you're always at the front looking forward. And sometimes because of the pride in the team, you could turn around and ask everybody, are you feeling okay? How are you doing today? And they'll all go, yeah, this is brilliant. This is the best trip I've ever been on. You think, well, I'm feeling okay, so I'll push on a little bit harder. And what you don't see is the one person in your team whose head drops and you know they're in such a big pain, pain locker that they want to go home. You can see all these little things at the back and you can manage them. Not um, quite overtly, but you can do that quite quietly in the tent or the way you do or your way you walk or your strategy for the next day. But also I think the advantage for me from leading from the back was if you're always at the front, you're constantly thinking about the here, the now, the decision making, the danger, the ice, the conditions, the polar bear, you know, the time, the speed, the sun, the wind, all those kind of things, the navigation. You have, you have no spare time or headspace to think about are we on track? Are we behind time? How can we go a little bit faster? Can I think of something that will help the team tomorrow? because you're constantly in the danger zone every day, every second of every day. So by being at the back of the team, that gave me headspace to think about where should we be next week? We're a little bit slow. I need to push the team a little bit faster. Or actually, we're so ahead of time. Why don't we have a rest day? Make a big call. So leading from the back, as long as we're going in the right direction, obviously, we're going north and not doing a, a U-turn south. As long as we're going in the right direction, that gave me head, headspace to think about the bigger project. I think the advantages for the rest of the team were really, really simple. They had to lead. 
They had to learn how to navigate by the sun. They had to learn how to check, navigate with a compass, the GPS, obstacle crossing. If they were uncertain when they came across a certain obstacle or a certain piece of ice, I was always there to coach them. Say, Alan, can you come up to the front? I really don't know what I'm doing. But that kept them emotionally engaged in the project. So we can talk about leadership and teamwork all day. I think on this trip, we either had, I became an integral team member or we had four leaders. I trusted the team so much that they could lead that hour, that two hours, depending on the length of the day. And it's a quality and it's a thing I try to put into place in most of the projects that I've ever been involved in, as long as I trust the team. The second thing I saw on, the, uh, on doing my five years research, it wasn't just how, how, it, how people wanted to pull a really heavy sledge to the North Pole, thinking that if they pulled a heavier sledge, success would be greater. It was a real lack of detail planning. And I suppose from my military background in, in the Royal Marines, this came second nature to me to actually get into the real, real fine detail and micro plan the project. So I realized that the old way of getting to the North Pole, I was trying to find out the, the, the tipping point where everybody failed. And it was normally within 10 to 15 days, purely because their planning was just adopted from the last team, whoever they were. And that team adopted it from the last team as well. So the old way of getting to the North Pole was really simple, too simple for me. And it was trying to do 10 North Commands every day for 50 days. So it was just times distance speed. We want to be on the ice for 50 days. It's 500 nautical miles. We'll do 10 miles a day. And what they didn't take into appreciation, which I find you know, incredible, was that the conditions on day one to the conditions on day 49 are literally worlds apart. Day one, we started at minus 55 degrees Celsius. I think we finished at minus 12. It was quite tropical when we finished. So the conditions are different. You're different. You're either fitter or you're weaker. The, the, the landscape is completely different. Obviously, your sledge weight is different. You can't have the same target and expect the same performance on day one that you can on day 49. So if we adopted out the old, the old style like everyone else did, this is exactly what would happen. This is day one. It's minus 55 degrees Celsius in this picture. I've got 22 stone tied to my waist. We have 20 minutes of daylight. We've just been dropped off on the last bit of land of Canada. We're now walking onto the frozen ocean against the tide. There's been a full moon. The ice is breaking up all around you, which is a little bit unnerving. And we've never really performed as a team under these conditions. So all of a sudden, I could say, well, the old, the old uh, plan said 10 miles today. So I say to my team, 10 miles today, day one. We make one mile. On day two, I get the plan out and say, right, team, 10 miles today. Oh, and the nine from yesterday, please. Can we do 19 miles today? We make a mile on day two. On day three, the team know that we've failed because the targets at the beginning of the project under those conditions were way, way too big and there's no way they could achieve that. So if you did a mile on day three, you went home on day four. So I realized that actually success wasn't about at the end of the project, success was right at the beginning. If I could get the beginning right, then we've got a good chance of actually getting to the top of the planet. So we came up with a seven stage plan. We were very fortunate to be sponsored by Johnny Walker. So we had a great um, sponsor of Diageo and we came up with a, a plan called keep walking it was a keep walking plan to the North Pole so just in short terms it was a seven stage plan so stage one believe it or not was only 11 miles in 11 days but the critics said it will never work why are you going to spend a fifth of your project time walking a fraction of distance because if we fail here at the beginning we've got no chance for the rest of the trip and I've invested five years of my life I'm not going to fail on the first hurdle I need to put a mini project in place to make sure the team's got the confidence. We also agreed if we got to a stage early, we'll jettison the food that we haven't used for that stage. We made that decision in the UK, in Somerset, in the office, which sounds a little bit crazy, really. Unsupported trip, no resupply, no parachute drop, nobody's gonna come and give us any food. We're not gonna get an ice saw out, make a little hole in the ice and start fishing like Pingu. So if, this, if we get rid of a resource now, we'll never see it again. So that's what we agreed in the UK, Hopefully, we won't have to make that decision. The first stage was 11 miles in 11 days. We got there in seven. Four days early. Stick to what we believe in. Four days early, we will jettison four days' worth of food, knowing we will never see this food again, and we've still got 495 miles, whatever it was, left to do. And the reason why we jettisoned the food was because we had complete belief in the strategy and the plan that we spent five years actually working towards. So four days worth of food that weighed 10 pound in weight. 10 pound in weight to me and the team, 10 pound each, was a massive amount of weight to jettison. Considering we had half a shoelace, half a pencil, half a toothbrush, we cut every label out of every garment. 
we had no wrapping on any any of the food just to save milligrams to get rid of 10 pound in, in one hit was a big deal but we did it we opened up the food bags that night put the food on the ice obviously the ice melts in the summer and all that food becomes whale food later on in the summer season and the reason why we jettisoned, jettisoned that 10 pound is that we stuck to what we believed in and we're sticking to our little mantra reduce the weight increase the pace and deliver the project so success for us was as important at the beginning as it was at the end we're heading off towards stage two amazingly we got to stage two four days early again so things were going brilliantly five years planning preparation training awareness risk assessments we're eight days ahead of target we're 20 pound lighter than we planned and all of a sudden you know the project was looking really achievable albeit we're still on stage two so second thing i'd really like to focus on on the leadership side of, of, of this project really and i know i've done a lot of preparation and upskilled myself living with the inuits and i hopefully made the team completely aware what they were letting themselves in for and i've embraced innovation over five years by looking at everyone else's failures seeing what's on the market and if there was something on the market a piece of clothing or equipment that i believed my team needed it wasn't there we had it made. So I've embraced all of these great things to get the project to where it was, the start point. We're believing in the strategy, we're delivering it on time, even, and then all of a sudden ahead of time. But I realize I've got to manage the, the team and their ex, not so much their expectations, but also I think that their behavior once they're under immense pressure. So I came up with an idea called Tent Time because I think when, when well, in fact, I know below minus 30 degrees Celsius, your, your body changes, your mind changes, the way you speak to people, the way they speak to you, the way you perceive what somebody says, all changes below minus 30. I don't know what it is, a chemo, chemical reaction in the brain when you're incredibly cold. Everything gets, gets magnified, uh, exposed and magnified on the ice. So I realized I've got to keep a little bit of harmony within the team under pressure. So I came up with a concept called tent time to try and keep the dynamic whole instead of separating the team when they were, when they were trying to deliver under this amount of pressure and stress. So every night I put up my tent and I tied a second tent to my tent. I did the cooking every night. I don't know why, but I felt responsible, even though there were volunteers. I did the cooking for everybody every single night to make sure that they were fed and watered. And while we're all in one tent, four of us squeeze into one little three-person tent with a cooker on, we had a very honest conversation in tent time. First part was a little bit brutal. Who's upsetting who? Straight away. Within the first hour, who's upsetting who? I got them to pick on me first. Alan, when, when you're at the front, you go too fast. And I never realized this because my body don't really kick in until about hour six or hour eight. So at the end of the day, when I'm feeling really, really strong, I want to push. But actually what I didn't recognize was the rest of my team were exhausted. So I was driving them into the ground. So let's look at it. You've got to slow down at the end of the day. So I recognize that, but that gives me permission in tent time to go around my team once every single night and just pick up these tiny little behaviors, which in every day back in the UK, back in the office or just in training, you would completely ignore, you don't see them. But because of where we were, the isolation, the exposure, they are magnified. So we manage people's behaviors every single night without hopefully letting all these behaviors bubble up and bubble up to a point where, you know, the team broke down or it was a massive argument. Second part of tent time was probably the most important part of our day and the most productive part of our day, albeit we were getting pushed backwards with the drift, because we've embraced innovation and we're, because we really believe in, in this new way of polar travel and the food and the sledge and the clothing, then we've come up with all these new ideas and hopefully big step changes before we actually went live. Because we've got this attitude and approach towards innovation, I didn't want it to stop once we're on the ice. Our best learning comes when we're under this immense amount of pressure, minus 55 degrees, 20 minutes of daylight, 20 stone tied to your waist, freezing cold fatigue, that's when you see the tiny changes that you could make to help the day to day. So second part of tent time, we agreed that every night when we leave the tent in the morning, but every night we're gonna come up with an idea to reduce the weight of the project. Some nights there were no ideas because you're physically exhausted. But I remember one night, Charlie came up with an idea and he said, Alan, we don't need that one centimeter of plastic on the end of the shoelace. I think it's called an aglet. It stops the shoelace from fraying. He said, if we set fire to the shoelace, it won't fray. And he was right. So I pulled eight bits of plastic off the end of our shoelaces that night, and I dangled them above the cooker, and they evaporated. But it wasn't the milligram we saved that night in tent time. It was the process. How do you keep the process of improvement alive when actually the easy option is to forget it, ignore it, don't think about it, don't apply yourself, and just fall asleep? So we made thousands of tiny little changes on this trip 
you know, just to just to change the weight of the sledge by a gram or a milligram. If we came up with a great idea, maybe half a pound. And it was keeping the mind engaged through tent time. After five hours of ridiculous ideas, two people went into their tent and they obviously went to sleep. Well, that gave me an opportunity now as the leader to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every team member once every three days, just to discover what they were really going through personally. And that was really important to get the team together, but also separate the team and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So tent time was really important. We headed off towards stage three and um, things were going really well. The team were, should I say happy? The team were doing all right. We we're ahead of target. Temperature was increased to about, uh, warmed up, sorry, to about minus 50, minus 40 on a good day. And all of a sudden, certain things happened. So you can see there, and Paul, bless him, his foot went through the ice. So we're still in mainly darkness, candles in the tent, head torches on. And Paul slipped through the ice, only up to his knee, but it, it was deep enough in that we had to stop for the day. And we finally cut his boot off because it was frozen, cut his socks off. And you can see on the side of Paul's foot, he had a frostbite, cold weather friction injury. So what we normally do is take the path of least resistance to mend this. And the path of least resistance is what Paul wanted. And that was antibiotics to stop any infection going into his bloodstream and up his leg and so on and so forth. But we're an unsupported trip by choice. We have very limited resource by choice. We chose to bring one course of antibiotics by choice. So Paul had forgotten that we had a conversation in the UK before we left um, for the Arctic that when things go wrong, we're not gonna take the path of least resistance to mend this. We're gonna, we're gonna try and create a second way of mending the problem to keep our best resource till we really need this. Now, Paul had obviously forgotten about this conversation, so it took us about two hours to convince him that we actually did have the conversation. So eventually, with his agreement, we stuck his head out of the tent, two guys sat on his chest, I sliced his foot open quickly with a scalpel, and we kept injecting pure iodine into the open wound. Incredibly painful for Paul, very amusing for the rest of us. After 30 seconds of pain or pleasure, depending on who you were in that tent, sewed his foot back together, sewed his sock back together, sewed the boot back together. Paul's been managed absolutely fine. The infection's been stopped. He's absolutely fine. But more importantly as a team, we've got the best resource. And that mindset kept the, kept the trip alive. Not us, we did that, but it kept the project alive by not just jumping in straight away and using the best resource. But that was the start of a really bad week I think I've dragged a sledge now about 8,000 miles, 25 polar trips to the ends of the earth, North Pole, South Pole, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Canada, all the cold places in the world I've dragged a sledge. I've never had such a bad week as this. And for me, really, it's just about the fact that we identify all the risks on the trip and we try and reduce the risk as much as we can. And I do believe you've got a responsibility as a team member, as a leader, or just as a project group, to be honest, to control the controllables. And I do believe we did that by the equipment, by questioning history, by using innovation, by reducing the risk of all the training evolutions we did, the, the team selection and training, and so on and so forth. Well, there's certain things out of your control. Firstly, Paul's foot, well, that was an injury. And secondly, all of a sudden, we have one or two incidents on the trip that you don't plan for, but you have to manage them as they, as they come in. So this night, Charlie said to me, Alan, I'd like to do the cooking. And I thought, selfishly, I'll take a night off. Charlie can cook. Obviously, I do blame myself because what happened, Charlie went to light the cooker inside a tent with four of us squeezed in there. He should have lit the cooker quite, quite slowly so we get a small flame. When he actually lit the cooker, the whole tent floor caught fire. It poured and spilled so much fuel, we couldn't see it. One through tires and two, all of us squeezed into a, a little tent. There was fuel all over the floor. And when he went to light the cooker, Feet, legs, boots, everything was on fire. Now, within seconds, three doors were undone, three people ran outside the tent, and I was at the back and I scooped everything up that was on fire and I threw it out. This happened within seconds, and obviously, we got outside, minus 50 degrees, stood outside. It wasn't until a moment of, of, of freezing cold was stood outside, you know, that reality check, that actually nobody said anything when this happened. This is something we practiced in, in the UK, in Wales, in Scotland. In Canada, in the base camp, it was one of our big risks if there's a fire in the tent. And not only did people leave the tent, which obviously I wanted them to do very quickly, on the way out, every team member picked up VHF radio, HF radio, satellite equipment, GPS equipment. We know we can afford to lose a tent. We've got two. The project carries on. We know we can afford to lose a sleeping mat. We've actually got two each. We can sleep on our coach. The project can carry on. If we lose one element of our safety equipment, it's game over. Five-year project is game over. So it's nice 
for me, looking back on this, that they acted in what I would call self-leadership, that they took the responsibility. They didn't wait to be told what to do every step of the way when things go wrong. We're only talking seconds, but seconds is a serious burn injury. And obviously for us, that would have been the end of the project. The next day, Charlie slipped 50 feet. We thought he'd broke his back. He couldn't feel his legs or his toes. So obviously that was the end of the day straight away. So we got him into the tent and it took us about six hours, but secondary observation, it just really hit his spinal, uh, sorry, his coccyx very hard. So yeah, his legs and feet, a little bit of feeling coming back. But we knew that was the end of the day. So we forced a rest day, 24 hours off. And what we did as a team is we gave Charlie temalgesic painkillers, which is about two or three down from morphine, I believe. So in the morning, we gave him the painkillers. But what we did as a group is we emptied his sledge. We could have said to him, look, stick yourself at the back of the team. Just try and catch up with us for the rest of the day until we, until we cover these three or four miles. That would have completely demoralized Charlie. So we took the weight away from him, but I didn't take away his job. I let Charlie carry on the next day as the breakfast walker, beginning at the front, front of the team, because that is what he was, he was proud of doing, was warming the team up first thing in the morning. So all we did then was distribute the weight from Charlie's sledge amongst the three of us, which slowed us down to a comfortable pace. It was just a simple way of managing Charlie's not so much the injury, but his motivation, thinking that he hadn't let the team down, and actually he's still got a big part to play in the project. The next day, and it's, you'll notice it's a lot about Charlie here. The next day, so it's day three of a really bad week, Charlie fell through the ice. Now you can forget you're walking on water. And this is something I try to reiterate to my team, and especially every time we go on the, on the Arctic Ocean, you are walking on water. There is no where you can step aside and find a little bit of land. It's about 1,500 miles to Siberia from it. So all of a sudden you get these reminders, these little cracks in the sea. So what you do is you make sure that you span, the, the crack is only narrow enough for you to span your skis across. And then once you get to the far bank, you pull your sledge as hard and fast as you can. Two of us have pulled our sledges so hard that the far bank had weakened, un, unnoticed to us. When Charlie leant forward, the bank gave way. The more he tried to get out, the deeper he was going in. It's hard to explain, but if you don't get that person out of the ice quick enough, the sledge can follow in, hit the person in the back, and actually push them onto that, that far ice flow. So we obviously, Paul turned around quickly. I don't know how he did this, but we pulled Charlie out by his hair. I undid his buckle to stop the sledge from pulling him back into the ice. And then we rolled him in the snow, stripped him naked, in a tent, in a sleeping bag, dry clothes, tot of whiskey in less than two minutes. And it wasn't just that teamwork, that element of teamwork and that practice rehearsal that enabled us to do that in two minutes. It went back to the five-year decisions of what equipment to take. What equipment do I choose to put in my team sledge that will give them the confidence not to do the trip, but the confidence to take on the risk? So I was never bamboozled by the cost of a product. Will that product, that piece of equipment, clothing, give my team the confidence to take on the challenge if they hit this certain element of risk? So for me, it was the five-year preparation and planning was all part of my greater journey of leadership to make sure that I'm constantly thinking about my team in every situation. We dried Charlie out, we let him carry on the next day. Unbelievably, within two hours, he fell through the ice again. And I know what you're all thinking. It was just unfortunate, and it really was. But there's an element of complacency there because even through our own, including mine, naivety, we'd hit most of the risks. There's only four risks on this trip. There's massive amounts of aches and pains and cuts and bruises and, you know, little bumps and everything, but there's only four risks. So you can imagine our risk on the side of the map is fire, we've ticked that box. Swimming, we've ticked that box. Injury, we've definitely ticked that box. So we only thought we would be, a, be a, the next or the last risk would be to be, to be um, approached by a polar bear. So we never expected that same risk to repeat itself time and time again, which was really naive but because Charlie went swimming again the team lost confidence they didn't lose confidence being involved happy to be in the challenge happy to be on the Arctic Ocean happy to be pushed into the North Pole they wanted no responsibility they didn't want to make a decision they didn't want to lead they didn't want to navigate they didn't want to be at the front they didn't want to choose the piece of ice in case they got it wrong and somebody else went swimming so I'm now leading the project from the front all day every day just to rebuild the confidence Physically and emotionally, that is exhausting. You can get burnt out at the front physically because you're breaking a trail for everyone else to follow. But emotionally, your brain is on that danger zone, the immediate. And if you're doing it for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, you can become frazzled. 
I just got the confidence back in the team. And then we had our biggest challenge where Paul came into the tent, pulled his mittens off. Sadly, his thumbnail stayed in his mittens. We had frostbite on his thumb. He has to leave. He makes a decision to leave. So we win a blizzard. We know we can't get picked up for three days. So I, I get hold of the radio. I speak to the base camp. They know where we are roughly. They tell the pilot. And basically the pilot says, we'll see you in three days when the weather lifts. I've never seen before or since how somebody, a team member, verbally can actually bring somebody else down you know, physically. Paul kept shouting to all of us, I'll be off the ice, on a plane, back at the base camp, nice and warm. You'll still be stuck out in the cold. He was completely right with that. But I've hopefully parked that thought, and my team have parked that thought, until we finish the trip. I don't care about flying back to a base camp or coming home or being warm. I've still got 300 miles to do. This is a five-year dream and project. So the first, second, third, fourth hurdle, I'm not going to fall. And I cer certainly don't want to be going back to a base camp until we finish the trip. Because he kept saying it time and time again. The next day, Jason got kidney failure. So bless him, he was in a real pickle, to be honest with you. You know, he, he turned really ill overnight. So he's now outside in a sleeping bag, rolling around screaming. Now I'm in a tough decision. Uh, sorry, a tough place. We're in a blizzard. We're getting pushed, pushed towards Greenland. Paul's got frostbite and lost his thumbnail. Jason's got kidney failure. He has to go to an hospital. So me and Charlie dug a 1,200-foot runway, which took us 48 hours nonstop with two tiny little shovels to make sure the plane can land. On top of that, we were moving our positions. We have to speak to the base camp and use our battery twice as much as, as we really want to. On top of all of that, I'm going to lose two, two team members from, from my team of four. So I quickly sp I saw the pilot, saw the plane, quickly spoke to the pilot, told him where the landing strip was, about half a mile to the west. I walked Paul and Jason halfway um, to, the, to the plane, which was quite an upsetting setting walk, to be honest with you. I could only walk them halfway because the rules were I wasn't allowed to meet the pilot and collect any stores. And the, and the other part of the rules were the team who were leaving, or half of the team that were leaving, had to take all of their clothing, equipment, and everything with them. So quite a tearful goodbye to Jason. Uh, and, and Paul. And as the plane took off, I walked back for the first time to see one tent. I've always had two. One team member, I've always had another three. So all of a sudden, it was a realization actually, our project was planned for four people to deliver. Our targets were set and goals were set for four people to deliver, four people to carry these sledges and this amount of weight over certain ice blocks. All of a sudden, targets are the same. I've lost 50% of my team. Brain power, you know, and physical power, I've lost 50% of my team. So we knew we couldn't change the targets because the degrees of latitude on planet Earth, I couldn't bend the North Pole any closer to us. So all of a sudden, we've got to come up with a really big idea now. We can carry on with this amount of weight in our sledges. However, we'll be so slow, we'll walk into failure. And we know that. So I don't want to carry on knowing that we've got no chance. I'm always trying to think of a way that at least we've got an opportunity to get to the next stage. So we made a really big decision. What you can see there is Charlie in a minus 50 sleeping bag. Behind him is a minus five sleeping bag. We slept in two sleeping bags every night to give us minus 55 degrees coverage. After 35 days, you have to sleeping bag, weighed about 30 pounds. Your body can emit up to a litre of moisture a night, get into the fabric, turn into ice. So you have to lie in that sleeping bag every night for three hours, shivering for three hours to try and your body heat to warm the ice to melt the ice sorry to warm the sleeping bag you burn a thousand calories every night just shivering so it became quite redundant so this was the decision process it's 24 hour daylight now it never gets dark it's only minus 35 there's only two of us if we can spend more time on the ice walking less time in the tent sleeping if we can sleep in a minus five sleeping bag at minus 35 for seven hours for one night we can do it for the rest of the trip so that night we slept at minus 35 in a really thin minus five sleeping bag and we slept for seven hours. In the morning, we stuck to the decision. A little bit of petrol, we set fire to the sleeping bag, safety rope, half a safety rope and two spare skis. So we lightened our load by about 40 pound each. The downside of that decision we really have to accept is that we're gonna be a little bit uncomfortable until the weather warms up. But it meant we can hopefully now reduce the weight we've done that, increase the pace and get to the next stage. The next two pictures really, the story is quite harrowing, but I, it really resonated to me about how important it was to get the team selection right. And I'm not talking about polar experience and, and physical prowess and could you run a marathon. This is about people's behavior and attitude I saw when they came down for selection. We got hit, you can see there by our tent, we got hit by a massive blizzard, massive storm from Siberia. So we were getting crushed, basically buried alive. 
One of us got the shovel, dug the tent out. That takes 30 minutes. Hand the shovel over, dig the tent out, 30 minutes. We dug our tent out nonstop every 30 minutes for 48 hours. One, obviously, to stay alive. Two, to keep the tent in one piece. And then me and Charlie had a very honest conversation. Listen, mate, physically and emotionally, can we carry on? And if we both answered yes, all we've got to do is change the way we're working. I'm not suggesting you do this, and I'm hoping it won't come to this once the pandemic lifts, but we went into a 28-hour day. It never got dark. So we used that as our advantage. We would walk for eight hours, rest for four, walk for eight hours, rest for eight. You can't sustain a 28-hour day forever. But what you do need is people that will go that extra bit, a little bit more, the extra mile, just to get the project back on track. And that is what I saw in Charlie. Now, we're so close to the pole. We're at 88 degrees, or just close to 88 degrees. And I don't know why I'm laughing now, because we had quite a, um, quite a difficult time after this, because everyone said to me, Alan, when you get to 88 degrees, there's a beautiful blue ring of flat ice. She'll skate to the pole in five days. I fell for that. Five years looking at atlases, maps, charts, sea charts. There is a beautiful blue ring of flat ice on a map, but we expected it to be actually on the ocean. So we camped really excited this night, like two little kids at Christmas, put the tent up, anchored it down. But the tent dropped that night, only a few inches, but it moved. Charlie got on nerves, went outside, and he came and he said, Alan, we're floating. And I'm laughing and shivering at the same time going, Mate, we've been floating for months. Well, no, 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 we really are floating. So I quickly put my little duvet slippers on, went outside with a big coat on. If you can imagine a piece of ice the size of a frozen football pitch, we're on top of that in the centre and we're drifting in open sea towards Greenland. So there's nothing we could do. Went back in the tent, slept for five hours, woke up. And our piece of ice now, the size of a football pitch, are probably reduced by 50%. So the size of a hockey pitch, we're on this piece of ice floating towards Greenland. A little bit of a tricky situation now. So we knew we were too far away from Siberia for a helicopter. And there were, the, the ice was, was too small for a, a, a plane, a small twin auto plane to land on. So all we did was sit down, put the kettle out, make a cup of tea and do a times distance speed graph. Every hour we took a fix of where we were. We took a positioning and then we realised that actually between the last and long of the two positions, the shortest distance, the slowest drift. We took this measurement for 36 hours. And eventually we realized that our piece of ice was going to connect onto the rest of the ocean and we jumped off. Everyone expected us to get back on track, to get back on the 74 longitude, which was the main longitude where we'd done all our research, where we had all our data, and that was the best route to the North Pole. We didn't. We sat there, kettle out, cup of tea, map, GPS to work out where we were. In less than two days, we drifted 400 miles off course and four miles back. It's not 400 miles you can imagine going up the, going up the motorway because the lines of longitude converge, but it meant we're approaching the North Pole from this angle. I've spent five years planning it from that angle. We have no data. We're on a completely new expedition. We have no plan. And when we crossed the 88 degrees, here's this beautiful flat ice everyone said we're going to hit. What you can see there is 15 to 20 feet high, razor sharp ice. The first thing that comes to your mind is not failure, not project failure. We can't do today's target. We can't do 20 nautical miles in that, you know, 40 kilometers. We've got no chance. So we have to reinvent the way or reinvent our, our performance now and try and measure a new performance to give ourselves a new plan. So we decided we would walk nonstop for 48 hours and see how far we got bobbing and weaving two of us through the ice. And we use that new distance as part of a, the base of a new plan. On the night of day two, even though it never got dark, we got caught in a whiteout. So I don't know if you've ever experienced a whiteout on a skiing trip or whatever. It's a frightening, frightening experience. We couldn't see up. We couldn't see down. I couldn't see Chan in front of me. I couldn't see left or right. Couldn't see the sun. And we couldn't see what was in front of us. We tied ourselves together on a piece of rope. Charlie fell through the ice twice. I fell through the ice twice. We never spoke to each other during the day because we couldn't see each other. But once we put the tent up at night, we hardly spoke to each other because we were mentally exhausted. And we never spoke to the outside world or the base camp because... We couldn't put the radio mast up and find our way back to the tent. After a few days, Charlie got snow blindness. We was vomiting up all the food we were having during the day. So I've now cut the card from his diary. I went and put the elastic from his underpants. And I made crude cardboard goggles to go over his normal goggles to stop the UV rays. The whiteout lasted 21 days. Didn't see a thing for 21 days. Didn't speak to the base camp or anybody for 21 days. We could have sat still. I'm not a big believer in that. And even if we sat still... And the, and the cloud and the storm lifted, the plane can't land in this terrain. We could walk east and west and try and look for flat ice. It won't be there. It might not be there. So do we lose hope, faith, and a bit of energy trying to find it? Well, there's one thing we know we can do. 
And we agreed five years ago, we will do whatever it took to keep going north. So we decided to grind our way north. And once on day 21, once we got a meter and five meters of visibility, we quickly spoke to the base camp to tell them where we were. The base camp's reaction was obvious and natural. Alan, you've run out of time. And I said, we're focused on the trip, but we're not blinkered. And the base camp said, Alan, Godspeed, best of luck. And that's easy, exact words. And time for us wasn't about days. So I've got an opportunity now to create more time, not by, by extending the day like we did before the 28 hour day, but by using the food to create time to deliver the project. So to quickly explain, the body intake was 6,000 calories a day. The output was 14,000. After day 32, we lost our body fat and the plan was to go down hill for 28 days. So all of a sudden, I can cut the calorific intake from 6,000 to 3,000 to 1,500 to 750 calories a day. So it's 750 calories in, 14,000 out, but that gave us four times the amount of days left to deliver the project. That's how we managed to create time to finish the project. And we got so close, 89 degrees, 60 miles to go, furthest British team ever to get this far, all of a sudden, huge river. Way too warm for this ice to freeze. So our options are fail, uh, playing across the river, failed. Playing to the North Pole, failed. Playing home, failed. So we decided to put the sledges in, we'll anchor the sledges down, we took a shotgun each, we walked two, two hours either side and we came back after two hours, put the tent up and believe it or not, we sat there for seven hours to make a decision to go left or right. Seven hours to make one simple decision. I could have said, I'm the leader, I put the project together, I've got the experience, follow me. After seven hours of discussion with Charlie, the most junior person on the team came up with the best answer and ultimately the best result. So we walked three days Charlie's way, never crossed the river, all along the bank of this river, we're now on 250 calories a day, which has got really interesting. So that was two squares of chocolate, half a cup of porridge and curry powder. So we made chocolate curry oat balls every night and then freeze outside. We had a piece of rope tied to two bags around our neck. Inside those bags was snow. They was underneath our jacket and the body heat would melt the snow to give us drinking water. We had 300 milliliters of fuel left and a big tot of whiskey, obviously honor the sponsor at the top of the planet. And after three days going Charlie's way, I said, right, we haven't crossed the river. We'll go back to the decision point and go my way. Fair play to him. The most junior person on our team said, Alan, we've always stuck to the decisions we've made. And he was right. Once we spent hours making that decision, we never went back. And I can't explain, but after eight hours, another eight hours of walking, we came across a bridge, huge platelets of ice. I walked across, turned around, shadows right behind me. We knew we'd done it. We had 59 miles left. Walk forward, sit on the sledge, fall asleep, fall off, walk forward. Charlie was at the front, not me at the end. I was absolutely physically exhausted. He got the GPS, he said, Alan, 10 miles, 9 miles, 8 miles, 7 miles. The 10th time Charlie got the GPS out for the first time in 71 days, this thing was reading south. Unbelievable. Five years training, five years planning, 71 days on the ice. We missed it. We're right over the top of the world. We're now on the Siberian side. So we quickly walked back 20 minutes. We got there twice, believe it or not. We walked back 20 minutes. And just before now on the 71st day, we became the first British team to get to the North Pole unassisted from Canada. Now, if I'm being really, really honest with you all, it was more relief than elation. Physically, mentally exhausted, but we had that conversation, as you would. This is the top of planet Earth. This is the North Pole. I'm never coming back. I'm never putting on skis again. I never want to see snow again. I said to Charlie, I never want to go anywhere with you again in my life. We've got a tot of whiskey, we'll have a party at the pole, we'll go home tomorrow. That was our plan. We put the tent up and you can see we anchored it down as we did every single day. We didn't even take a risk on the very last day thinking, oh, we won't do it. And that'll be the day it blows away. So we anchored it down, made it secure, just got inside the tent, plane landed to pick us up. Five years work for 20 minutes at the North Pole. I was so upset. Amy landed the plane. She said, boys, you've got 20 minutes, otherwise you're walking up. She taxied the plane. Sky News man popped out. We did a live interview with Sky News. We had a lovely letter from Her Majesty the Queen. And more, not a more important, as importantly for me, I had a fantastic handwritten letter from Ronald Fiennes who had attempted this six times. And it just said, congratulations, Alan. Finally, a British team has made it to the North Pole unsupported. Any injuries, I, I hope they heal quickly. Best wishes, Ron Fiennes. So it was finally unlocked, the mystery of walking from Canada to the North Pole. And we flew back to the base camp, took two days. I don't want to shock anybody, but I never had a wash for 71 days. Never took my clothes off for 71 days. And we got back to the base camp First time I took my clothes off and we'd lost 25 kilograms each. We lost three and a half stone of body weight each. I didn't weigh this little since I was at school. 
But I look at these pictures and think, do you know what? I've still got two weeks left in me. I still believe we can do this. And belief for me is not about what I believe I can do physically and emotionally. Belief is knowing that in those difficult situations, on that floating ice cap, when Charlie's gone swim, when the tent's burning down, when Paul's got his injury, the decisions we make on the ice in that situation, I've got to believe that my support team in Canada, in London, and everybody is believing we're doing the right thing. That's what I hold on to, not just my own personal inner belief. So it was, a, it was an incredible journey for me. Um, five years work just to get to the start point. And I've gone back 14 times. You know, it, it plays a really big part in my heart, in, in, my, in my life, the North Pole. And every year the ice melts and every year it refreezes. So you can't just do what you did last year. I have a new team every year. And I normally spend, you know, a good eight to 10 to 12 months training the team to get them prepared for what they're going to encounter. But also myself, because I know what's coming. So I put myself back out on the ice because if you want to bring all this back to leadership, for me, leadership is service. It never stops. You've got to stay on top of your game. So touch wood, we've always got there. We've never failed. I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but we've always got there. I've never got there on plan A, plan B, plan C or plan D. We've always had, excuse me, the ability, the ability to um, adapt, overcome, and basically reinvent ourselves. So for me, what opera really means is ordinary people, extraordinary results achieved. I do believe we're all born ordinary. I'm an ordinary person, but I've had the opportunity to work with people who think like me. I've got no barriers in my head whatsoever. I think anything is achievable. And, and if the time I meet these people who want to come and do these trips and they don't believe that, I've got a year to actually change the way they think and change their mindset, that actually they can achieve it. But just to summarize really, you can see that people think this trip is quite a, quite a physical trip, a physical trip. It actually is quite a physical trip, but it's as important to make sure you've got the mental resilience. So I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the team that come on the ice cap, whether it be North or it's South Pole or, or some of the challenges in the middle, they have that mental resilience because we're all going to doubt ourselves one day. We're all going to doubt whether we can physically do it, mentally do it, and especially when you've got those, those curveballs, you know, the things you can't control and then they hit the project and the challenge. So we spend a lot of time trying to work on the, on the mental resilience of people, making sure that, 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 that they're not, that, well, they have, they have the skill set and they're also the mindset to carry on. So thanks very much for listening. Um, I don't know where we are, John, with questions, but um, I appreciate everybody tuning in today. And I wish you all the very best and, and please try and stay safe. Or anything. Thank you, Alan. That's terrific. Um, that's an incredible story. We're just running a little bit um, behind schedule, so we're going to just take a few questions. We're going to keep them short and sharp. Um, the first question we got in is from John Henderson, um, and the question is, "What's your biggest challenge to date?" Uh, I, I think really looking back on it, I didn't see it at the time, but the transition I think from a military career, you know, into the outside world. I, I, even now, I don't think that the military get prepared enough once they transition. It's a completely different world to what you've been, been used to. So I was, I was fortunate in a way that I went into adventure because it gave me that purpose. But sometimes you can lose the purpose in what you're doing. So the hardest challenge really is to maintain a purpose in your second career, third career, or life, to be honest with you. And I, I think, you know, we could talk about challenges and how cold it was here and how difficult it was there. But that transition from one side to another, really, and, and maintaining a purpose. Okay, great. Um, a question from Jennifer. Um, Peter, I'll bring you into this one. How do I lead my business to shift from offline to online quickly? Um, yeah, I think that, um, well, before I answer that, I just want to make a couple of points, really, is that, um, um, uh, that uh, going on to... Uh, some of the points that Alan made. What struck me about what you what you said, Alan, and 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 it was very marked. Really, was was your humility um, as a leader, and and I think that that is something that's that's very often um, underestimated. Uh, I think Mike Tyson, when he was recovering from his um, addictions and, and and the turbulent life that he led, famously said that if you are not humble, life will visit humbleness upon you. And uh, and what struck me about the the journey you took was um was your readiness to uh, particularly in the incident with charlie uh when you were deciding which way to go 
um, was to let him take the lead, despite your experience, despite your knowledge. And there's, a, there's an interesting work done by um, a, a writer called, a science writer called Philip Tetlock, who evaluated uh, 28,000 um, different uh, predictions by a variety of, of experts. And, and, and the one thing, one of the key conclusions that he and, and, uh, came to as a result of that, uh, of that study was that those people who were the most famous, who had the biggest profiles, made the greatest errors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and that's actually fascinating. So there seems to be a, an inverse relationship, if you want, between fame and status on the one hand and accuracy on the other. So that really struck me in your story, really, your ability, your humility and your ability to, as you said, in every sense of the word, lead from the back. And the second thing was to focus on what you could, uh, what you could, what you could control. You couldn't control you were 400 miles off course. You couldn't control, you know, if somebody fell through the ice, but you could control your reaction to it and how you dealt with it. And you did it in, in one small stage at a time, not trying to solve all problems or finish the exhibition in your head before it was done. So I think that humility and focusing on what you can control really are, are two things. If you want to move your business in a, in a crisis from, from offline to online, uh, without talking about the technicalities of that at the moment, and the psychology of it is very clear. Firstly, you need to be uh, humble. You need to recognize what you can and can't do and what you can and can't control. You need to get advice from people and not assume that you know what the best solution is. And you need to listen to that advice and advise it and, and evaluate it rationally without allowing too much emotion to get in the way. Um, so again, the principles of leadership, whether you're going to the, to the North Pole or whether you're trying to move a business from offline to online in a crisis, I think remain constant and, and humility and focusing on what you can control are certainly two of the cornerstones of that. Thanks, Peter. Just to follow up on that, um, for Alan, um, this is a question from Tracy. There's quite a lot of people that are on furlough. Everyone's wor working remotely. There's quite a lot of anxiety amongst workforce. So how do you lead from behind? That was the sort of point you made, but how do you lead from behind in a crisis like this and motivate your team? Yeah, I mean, for, for me on, on, on the expeditions, on the projects, you know, I think you can see from, from, from that story, we don't think too far ahead. You know, there's no point in me thinking about 50 miles ahead because wind direction, storms, ice can break up and we could be shifted. So I don't think too far ahead. So I, I think for me, really, part, part of the anxiety, of pe people are trying to predict the future. What's going to happen post-summer when the economy comes back, work comes back, is there going to be a job, all the rest of it. We have no control over that. And you can burn out mentally about that, you know, which affects your whole well-being and everything else. I got involved in a huge leadership program in 2008, post the financial crash. We were invited by a global insurance company to put together a multi-tiered leadership program, which was quite interesting because when everybody else was, was pulling the funding from anything outside of, you know, the immediate operations, they invested heavily in all of their leaders, from the junior leaders to talent pool, from talent pool to junior to middle to senior leaders. And their whole philosophy, and it was brave from the CEO at the time, was to say, right, once we get through this, we don't want to be playing catch up. We don't want to be learning. We want to be hitting the whole economy, you know, running at 100 mile an hour. And that was a really brave decision. So I, I think if there's one little bit of advice, really, you know, and, and for, for, for any company or any business, is whether it be, I don't mean invest financially, but just invest in them emotionally. You've got to keep them engaged. You've got to keep them, you know, their well being, especially their, their, their mental resilience, has got to be invested in now. They can't be ignored. Because if you ignore them now, they won't be ready for, for when, when the drawbridge comes down and we all run through, the, run through it. So I think, I think it's, a, it's the right time to invest in, in any of the workforce, any individuals you know, that, that are struggling with anxiety. And for me personally, it's like, I think you can only plan about a week at a time at the moment. I really do. I don't think we should be looking beyond that. Good advice. Um, just taking a step away into the, from leadership, for a moment into the practicalities of what you experienced. We've had a question from Martin. Uh, you said it was a great story. Have you seen the impact of global warming? Um, bit of a diversion, but really an important one, especially for yeah. where we are at the moment as a planet. I spent 20 years on the Arctic Ocean and, and um, I, was, I was a lecturer with a, an incredible, with, a, with the mayor of Alaska and the head of um, the US climate cell at Columbia University two years ago. Uh, and and le amazing lady Maureen, she said to me, she could, she could 
bamboozle you with facts and science and figures and graphs. And she said, Alan, the best way to explain what's going on with the Arctic Ocean, because it touches so many countries and continents, is that it should freeze six months a year, the Arctic Ocean, and it acts, when it's frozen, it acts as a mirror to um, bounce those, those rays back up to the sun. Six months frozen, six months unfrozen. What's happening at the moment is the Arctic Ocean is only freezing for five months. So that extra month where it's not frozen, all of that heat is coming into the ocean. It's affecting all of the, you know, the microorganisms, the, even the big, the, the blue whale, huge big mammals, it's been affected by those extra four weeks of sun. So it is changing. And it's the unpredictability about the change. So I remember one year, maybe eight, nine years ago, we were on the Arctic Ocean, we went from minus 41 to plus one overnight. And that causes huge problems, obviously, not just with your clothing that gets soaking wet, but obviously the danger, the ice is cracking up everywhere. So that was a 42 degree influx in, in 12 hours. So things are changing. You can't be ignored. I don't know what the solution is. You know, I, I, every year I go to a, a Russian scientific research center on climate and I see the same American scientist there, an incredible guy called Andy. He's worn the same jumper for 15 years. We know it's him a mile off. And I say to him, Andy, come on, what's happening? And he said, Alan, he said, we need 100 years. He said, no, he said, we've got 10 years of data this big. He said, we need 100 years of data that big to make any predictions. He said, we're still miles off working out what's going on. You know, but it is there. It, it, it is there, definitely. Um, back to leadership, Peter. Um, Rita's just asked a question. She, she runs a software business. Um, and she's talking about remote leadership specifically within the context of software and um, perhaps some of the personas of, of people that are more te technical in their nature and dealing with them remotely. Um, any thoughts and tips? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by dealing with uh, people who are more uh, technical in their nature, but I think that, that um, you know, the, the issues that we face, whether people are technical or, or not technical, that the base psychology remains remains very much the same. If by technical you mean that some people prefer to deal with, with uh, smaller problems or more detailed problems, they're more likely to dive into the detail of things, whereas perhaps less technical people have a, have a vision of a bigger picture. Obviously that's two different psychological approaches to problem solving. Well, one, the majority of us prefer the big picture and we work better when we have, a, uh, a, if you want, a, a bird's eye view of a problem, whereas some people really do enjoy driving into the detail. Now, what's, what really strikes me about, again, Alan's story is that, that the planning, um, you know, the, the, the planning and, and also the, the, um, the fact that when the plans failed, if you want, when, when plan A failed, when plan B failed, when plan C failed, and he was thrust into a circumstance which was, you know, unforeseen, all that detailed planning um, didn't go to waste, but it had to be amended. It had to be adjusted. He had to adapt. And really the lesson, whether you were technical or non-technical and, and trying to manage your way through any kind of problem is you must be adaptable. Sometimes people who, who don't like diving into detail will have to dive into detail or more importantly, find people who can support them in that process. People who are less comfortable I think we've just got a, um, a perhaps a bit of a bandwidth issue with Peter. Um, we'll move on. Um, morale is a question, Alan. Um, keeping morale high, especially when there's a crisis and people are uh, anxious about things. Any particular points around the morale? I, I think going on from Peter, really, what, what he was trying to say, I, I, I cannot, can understand because for me, when the, when the morale was low in the tent, it was all about the uncertainty, the unknown. So I invested five years. So I've got five years of libraries of books and, and um, reports and also people be unnerving themselves for the unknown. So for me, the investment in five years and reading that knowledge base was something we, we all drew on in the tent. And it may sound a little bit silly, but I think we should try and smile at least once a day, even now. You've got to find something to smile about. You can spend the whole day about doom and gloom. You, know, you can have the news on all day, every day, and eventually it will chip away and chip away at you. So I think that we've got to have a, a way of trying to maintain positivity. If it's just a little smile, there's so much goodwill in the nation at the moment. 
even that should make you feel proud and positive. It's unbelievable amount of goodwill. And I'm hoping there is a new narrative and a step change. But there was, um, there's a great quote by Ernest Shackleton. He once said, optimism is true moral courage. You know, and I think we can all remember that. There, there is going to be a future. There, there is going to be a future out there. You know, it's not, this is not the end of it. It might be a different future, but it's not the end of it. Great. That's a great quote. I think we'll finish on Shackleton's quote. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, Thank you very much, John. The, um, That's really good. Thank you. Just to um, introduce, this is part of a series on Digital Lifeboat. It's the title of the whole series of webinars. Um, next week, we'll be looking at how we can leverage technology in a crisis. Uh, we'll be joined by some guests from a company called Presensol who'll be working with us. Um, the week after, I'd like to um, mention that we've got HubSpot, which are owned by Google, one of the biggest um, sales and marketing cloud-based platforms, or perhaps the biggest uh, cloud-based platforms working in sales and marketing worldwide. And we've got one of their um, senior execs coming to work with us and um, do a webinar. So we'd love you to join us. And finally, we just want to say thank you. A um, couple of things that you might want to do. One is you might want to grab a virtual coffee with somebody from Cognition. We'd be delighted to do that. Otherwise, also look at Extreme Leaders. Um, there's a link there which will send you the slides and you can follow the link and you can do an online program um, and test your own leadership using that online program. So thanks so much. Um, have a great Easter. Keep yourself and your family safe.